I'm your host, David Cameo, and we are Squawking Dead, a podcast pulverizing episodes of the Walking Dead universe. But not today. Today, we're Better Squawk Saul, covering Better Call Saul's sixth and final season. Today's episode, we're going to be covering the sixth episode of Better Call Saul's final season, titled Axe and Grind. Uh, as is as has been with the last few episodes, this episode will contain both the reaction video and the full episode breakdown. But in the meantime, first, enjoy the episode. I hope you do. And if you do, or you don't, head over to ratethispodcast.com slash squawkingdead and leave us five stars in eggplant to let us know that you love us. But I would recommend letting us know more as this whole Better Call Saul project is a new one. And we'd really, really enjoy your feedback. Let us know what you liked, what you didn't like, whether we should stick to the Walking Dead universe, or if you really, really love what we're doing here. When you leave your social media accounts in your review, we can actually tag you in the post when we share it out. Uh, But more than anything else, it's a great way to let us know if we're on the right track or not. Uh, I hope you enjoy this reaction video, or sorry, reaction episode. And uh, I will be coming back here again to let you know when the full episode breakdown starts. So in the meantime, enjoy. Hey, everybody. That was Hence. <laughs> Kim's got me a little worried. This is just, of course, our, our after show thoughts. But I would say that I really love the Kim opener with the earrings, especially because everybody has made a big deal out of those. And it's neat to see where they came from. And that her mother was orchestrating her in scams when she was just a kid. That's that's very interesting to know about Kim. It was a very, very, very good episode. <laughs> we got a little peek on everything except for Gus. You know, we got to see what Mike was doing. We got to see what Joanne and Kim were doing. We got to see a little bit of what Lalo was doing, what Howard was doing. So I felt like it was a really comprehensive episode. It's definitely a setup episode. I mean, they're putting all the pieces in place for the mid-season finale. They left a lot of things hanging, but that's really to be expected in a in a setup for the finale. Mike and, and Kaylee was very sweet. Oh, <sighs> We, I know we we talk all the time about them like kind of dragging things out and putting unnecessary stuff in there, but that was one of those things that really worked because you know Mike loves his granddaughter and of course he doesn't want to be anywhere near her right now mm-hmm. with the threat of Lalo hanging out there. That broke my heart. It was mm-hmm. so sad. I didn't think Lalo was going to go for Casper. I thought he would go for Kai, but I guess Casper makes sense. I couldn't remember his name. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that was the guy I was thinking he would go to because I remember him having the most memorable reaction when they were all saying, when Mike was sending them all off, Mm. he was the one that hit Mike, didn't he? He was the one that got up and told him that Werner was worth a thousand of him or something like that. Yeah. I remember him being really upset about it. It makes sense. He would be the one to be thoughtful enough to give a gift to Marguerite. I wasn't expecting it to be him, but, but I wasn't mad about it. Maybe he won't break. Maybe we'll see a little bit. Out of one of the other guys, I don't know. I mean, he doesn't really have any loyalties. For, I mean, he signed whatever and like promised not to say anything, I guess. So there's that threat. But I mean, Lalo's going to, I mean, it's lose, lose for him, right? He doesn't know where it is because they took him in and out of the truck. So they he can't even tell him where it is or anything like that. He could tell him like the specs and stuff that they were building, but I don't think they even knew what they were building. It was just something they were building underground. So there's not a whole lot he could tell him. Werner might have been the only one who knew the end results of the project anyway yeah there really might not be much he can say he did seem to recognize the name fring when Mm -hmm. when lalo's like i'm here about fring maybe the proof is that he knows that they were working for gus or something like that they may not have to prove where it is or anything like that do either of you have any idea of what the scam is that kim and jimmy are up to no (laughs) i really (sighs) don't so the photos Seem to be of some sort of handoff mm-hmm. between the judge and Jimmy, right? Or is it That's what it looked be- like? Okay, so I don't really understand. Like, what are we trying to do here? You're like trying to put doubt on Howard, then you're trying to put doubt on the judge. Like, I don't, I don't really get where we're going at all. I guess if they can cast doubt on the mediator of the case, it's something else they can use to kind of push them to settle faster. There's two strikes against them. 
to me, it almost seems like this would prolong the amount of time. I don't, that's. Well, no, I, no because, because what, what it is, is they've been working on this case for years. And if it suddenly comes to light that one of the lead attorneys on the case is taking payoffs, the case would be sunk. It wouldn't be a case anymore. So if they can throw enough doubt on the people that are involved in it, then HHM, I think, oh, but we need to settle right now before this comes to light and the whole sh- case gets shut down and we don't get anything. They're trying to cast enough doubt that they can just hurry up and settle the case before the whole thing just falls to pieces. That makes sense. I guess I was thinking of it in terms of the residents of the Sam Piper. Mm-hmm. I'm like, this just seems like this would prolong this for them because if this comes to light, then they would find new counsel and like they would start the whole process over again. It would be like 10 times as long. So that's why I was like, I don't really understand. <laughs> but, but I get I get what you're saying. What will happen is HHM will be like, no, no, no. Yeah, we have to settle, this, settle right now. We get what we can right now before the whole thing falls apart. I'll be honest, when they were talking about having people on Alameda Street, I thought it was Nacho's dad. That they were watching. Me too, actually. I did too. I did that's, too. That's why I thought Mike was being so stern about it. Mm-hmm. I mean, it makes sense that it's his granddaughter, but that guy was right. That's a real long shot. <laughs> <laughs> why would Lalo ever end up there? But I mean, I can understand Mike wanting to be better safe than sorry. Well, I wonder if Mike isn't protecting them from... His side, too, almost. Could be. His guys are going to be loyal to him, but the yeah. people above him. Lalo does mm-hmm. know who he is. And the fact is, Kim knows who he is. So if Lalo got his hands on Kim and said, mm-hmm. who is this guy? She would be like, he worked at the toll booth and they could look up toll booth. I mean, it would be so That's easy true. to find out who Mike was mm-hmm. just through other public people. Public records. Yeah. Oh, yeah, public records. Oh, uh, Kim, I kind of thought maybe she knows she's getting this other deal that she would call off sandpiper but apparently she's not gonna do that no this bitch is committed to this shit she flipped the car around so fast to be like no this is happening now which is crazy to me because you have the opportunity to get exactly what it is that you want so that isn't all that you want Definitely going to have to rewatch again because there were a lot of finer points I'm sure I missed. You watch it the first time, just like, oh, oh, what? (laughs) At least there was no dog to worry about this time. (laughs) (laughs) Only for a brief second. Just the tiny one. But he was at the vet. So it was okay. okay. (laughs) It was nice to see Dr. Caldera. That was fun. The the black book with um, the disappearance. So is that what we thought was Kim's? Was Kim's, yeah. 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 Okay. So not Kim's. (laughs) No. (laughs) Wrong again. Why did we think it was Kim's? When she was writing down the numbers on the license plate, she pulled the little black book out of her, like out of a pocket and was was writing down. And then I just remember the black book being thrown into the the box. I was like, oh, it's the same black book. But as usual, I was wrong. Okay. Not as usual. You've called you've called some pretty good things. Just not this one. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to go back and screen grab one of those pages and see if I can't figure something out. Yeah. I really liked it. My stomach was in not very anxious episode. I'm just like <laughs> <laughs> The, the only time. other thing I had to say is that Lalo delivering the line, I don't speak German. Because <laughs> <laughs> he just spoke German and then he's like, I don't speak German, dude. Yeah. It's just, I don't know, it really got to me. <laughs> it was pretty good. <laughs> when Tim and Jimmy hugged and kissed goodbye, I felt like that was the last time they're going to do it. And it was really upsetting me. <laughs> Oh, I was like, oh, it just feels like it's the last time they're going to see each other. Oh my God, what happened? What's going to happen? Oh my God. Oh. I will well, be she's sure. on her way back now. I'll be angry, but these series are not known for having happy endings. So let's go ahead and prepare myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know where Jimmy ends up. <laughs> yeah, but where does Gene end up is the question. I don't know. Yeah, we haven't seen Gene in quite some time. Mm. I know. Oh, man. One more week before the mid-season it comes back july 11th okay so not too long okay. of a wait yeah not a huge break that's good not like the year they made us wait between 5a and 5b <laughs> <laughs> all right guys i guess that's it i really wish i didn't have to get up so early in the morning and i wasn't so tired so i could think more clearly and watch it again and have more to say but i'm <laughs> sure we'll have more on thursday so good night good night bye bye, bye. Oh boy, I hope you enjoyed that episode reaction to 
Better Call Saul's sixth episode titled Axe and Grind, and now for the full episode breakdown. Hi, I'm Bridget. Did you know that you have rights? The Constitution says you do, and so do I. I believe until proven otherwise, every man, woman, and child should hear this podcast. And that's why we talk to you, Internet. Better Squawk Saul. Welcome, everybody, to your Better Squawk Saul. On second watch, there was a lot more to it. Because it is just kind of a setup episode. I feel like the last few, probably two or three, have just kind of, since Nacho died, have just been episodes that are setting us up for the big mid-season finale. But again, if you go back and rewatch and really pay attention to some of the details, there's a lot of information in this episode. What was the name of the episode again? Axe and Grind. This is a good feeling to watch something that I'm excited for and... At the end of this episode, I like I can't wait to see what's going to happen. I feel like that's what an episode should do. At the end of it, you should be wanting more. And that's exactly what happened at the end of this one, too. A lot of setups, but also a lot of little tidbits about our characters. It was a great episode. It was very well done. It was um, directed by Giancarlo Esposito. Yeah, Esposito. So that was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Was pretty cool excellent job my lazy ass did a little more research than normal and i actually read about the episode afterwards which i do not normally do i had read some stuff about how this is genuinely like one of the best television shows uh, in existence at the moment which i think is pretty cool that we get to cover this in in real time I'm just glad I have people, I I got enough people to watch it that I have people to talk about it with. (laughs) That is the worst when you love a TV show and you have no one to talk to about it. I know. Dennis will talk TV shows with me, but not to the extent and depth that I enjoy talking TV shows. It's not quite the same. Uh, Travis the other day They don't get as excited as we do. Something Mm -hmm. happened and I like got really like skeeved out by it. Like it was like something we watched on TV or something and I was like, "Ah, ah." like it was like something like maybe like someone fell and like knocked their nuts or something and i was just like really like oh god and he looked at me and he goes i just want you to know that feeling that you have right now that's how i feel anytime you put on any walking dead show ouch i was oh. like clearly i can't talk to you about it yeah it's pretty funny that hurt oh. <laughs> And Ow. I took that personally. <laughs> right. right. I like just slink off to the bedroom. Fine. He'll sit there and, and deal with it. But I mm-hmm. I feel for him. Same here. Same here. <laughs> Dennis just watched 709 and 710. Oh, dang. Because usually, I, oh, usually no. I'm like, you got to watch it with oh, me. No. And I have been putting it off. <laughs> oh, like, no, Dennis. Don't watch this. I'm like, you sh- I'm like, are you sure you want to watch after you just heard us bitch about it straight? He's like, I'm going to see right? if it's bad as they said it was. <laughs> right? So he watched 709. He was like, well, that was a waste of my time. Yeah, that's pretty much Eric. He's like, should I even watch it? The way you guys are talking. I'm like, maybe wait till the season's over and then binge it. So I was listening to the Insider podcast. and um, the episode or Giancarlo Insider? Giancarlo Esposito. Yeah, Insider. <laughs> Giancarlo Esposito was on there. And let me tell you how weird it was to hear him speak in his real voice. I don't know if I ever have, to be honest. I've heard it like once or twice. And every time I'm like, it like it doesn't seem it's, right. It's <laughs> so weird. It is so weird. It's like when you hear when you hear Lenny James mm. speak mm-hmm. off camera. And it's just like, huh? what? What? <laughs> it was very interesting. But I've spent the whole time going, what? I mean, that's not him. It's, uh, stop. It sounds wrong. Why are you talking like that? Stop it. He has directed things before. This isn't his first foray into directing. Has he directed other Better Call Saul episodes? No. Oh, He's okay. directed like short films okay. and some movies and stuff like that. Nice. I didn't look any of them up. Again, as I always say, if you're really interested in hearing how the sausage is made, go check out The Insider. They they talk about a lot of really interesting stuff. Our opener is Kim. Man. Just stole some earrings and her mom comes in. My first thought was that they were scamming the store. But after rewatching, I realized that Kim legitimately tried to steal the earrings and got caught. And the store manager called her mother in and um, her mother basically talked her way out of it. This is a very important scene where Kim is concerned. Number one, there's so many different ways to look at this, but I feel like 
she wants some kind of structure or consequences in her in her world and she doesn't get any she did this to get her mother's attention and she's almost happy there's a there's one little part where her mother is just reaming her out and she's almost smiling because she's like yes finally my mom is gonna lay down the law on me and make me do something you know and, and give me some boundaries but instead as they walk out her mom is like ah oh, that sucker nip it so in if, the then, bud right <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you if you notice, Kim, she when they come out, she holds her mom's hand like, finally, you're being a mom. It made her happy. And then when her mom's like, ah, nip it in the bud, that sucker. And she doesn't stop, but she drops her mom's hand and you just see the realization that her mom doesn't want to lay down any boundaries for her. She's not going to be a mom. It's an exact callback to when Jimmy goes before the law board to get his license back and they come out and... Kim's holding his arm and they're happy. And she's like, yeah, that was awesome. And he's like, yeah, that was suckers. And Kim just stops dead in her tracks and drops his arm and just gets that look on her face like, oh my God, he, he played me too. This was all fake. I love that little parallel. In the first flashback we see with Kim, she stands up for what she believes to her mother. And she's like, no, I'm not going to ride with you because you've been drinking. And her mother does not reward her for that. Her mom drives off and fucking leaves her standing there with a cello to walk three miles. But this time, when she goes along with her mom, her mom rewards her. Even though in her heart she knows it's wrong, that she still, that's what she knows to do. And I, I love that the song that's playing is The Reflex by Duran Duran as they're <laughs> driving away. So the lyrics are, why don't you use it? Try not to bruise it. Buy time, don't lose it. The reflex is a lonely child who's waiting by the park. The reflex is in charge of finding treasure in the dark. Very, sounds, very fitting. Yeah, very appropriate. Yeah. And watching over Lucky Clover isn't that bizarre. Every little thing the reflex does leave you answered with a question mark. Kim is getting that reinforcement that doing the wrong thing is the way to get things done. And somehow, even though she's evolved over the years and tried to do everything by the book, because she wants more, she doesn't want to be that. She doesn't want to be her mom. She's tried to do more over the years. She never lost what, what she was taught. Mm -hmm. And now that she has Jimmy, who is very much like her mother, and that he is going to reward her for bad behavior. Bad behavior. <laughs> I just feel like this scene gave us a huge insight into Kim's psyche, where Jimmy and, and her scammy is concerned. Absolutely. It's a it's a learned behavior that happened at that moment. Like you said, like you do something bad, you get a reward. And that's exactly what's happening with with Jimmy. She's doing bad things to get her reward, which, you know, the sandpiper money. Right. And the thing is, this probably isn't the first time that Kim has done this and it's worked and it's worked out this way, because obviously that's her motives. Like if I do this, this happens. And so why wouldn't she do it? Do you think her desire to do pro bono work and do good is to balance out all of the shady shit she's probably done in her past. I don't know. I almost feel like she has more, I don't know if it controls the right word, but freedom in the pro bono work. Whereas where if she's working under Schweikert in Maine, she had bosses and you have to do it this way and, and that way. But with the pro bono work, there's a lot more freedom for her to do the good because it's the right thing to do. I think she just truly wants to help people that can't help themselves more than maybe outweighing the bad that she's done. She's trying to do this karmic balance or something. Also, maybe because she was one of those people that <coughs> couldn't help themselves for a long time. Absolutely. Maybe she wished someone like her would have gotten involved and helped more. So she wants to be that person for someone else. It'd make a lot of sense. I find it really interesting that the earrings that her mother steals for her are the earrings that she's still wearing. Well, just goes to show that she hasn't let any of that go. Mm -hmm. That's still an important part of her life. She has that reminder on every single day. And I think that tells a lot about the kind of person that she is and how much that's still intertwined and important to her day-to-day -day life. For some people, you do the right thing by going to therapy and like working through that kind of stuff to get out of it. You have to go through it to get out of it because if you bury it down... It's just going to come up later, or if you kind of try to just float over it, it's still there. So she clearly didn't go that route, or at least we're not seeing that. Because whatever she did, even if she did attend therapy or something, I could see Kim as being one of those people that doesn't truly ever let all of her cards show. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. So yeah. she wouldn't be the type of person to go to therapy and really open up. Like, she would have to want to do that work in order to get to that point. You know, whereas we see Howard go to therapy and he just lays it all out there. <laughs> it's interesting to see the differences in everybody this season. Do you think Kim keeps the earrings? Because, as you know, her mom says, I didn't think you had it in you. And, mm. I mean, really, nobody ever thinks Kim has it in her. Jimmy is surprised by her. And Howard, Howard is definitely, definitely surprised yeah. by her. Does she keep the earrings to remind herself of what she doesn't want to be or what she does want to be? Ooh. I don't know. Yeah, Ooh. that's a really, See, that's a I was really al- good question. I was all ready to answer this, and then you flipped the question on me. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say she wears them to, to remind herself of what she's capable of, but that could have two different responses to that as well. Like, yeah, this is what I'm capable of, but is that a good thing or a bad thing? Ooh. Maybe it depends on the day. (laughs) (laughs) I wanted to say one stupid thing, and Dave can definitely cut this out, but the scene where they're walking out of the store, right, and the guy's holding the door, and Kim's standing there, and he's he's like, he's super creepy, right? And he's like, you gotta gotta find mom there, blah, blah, blah. So, for whatever reason, the scene... The scene from Forrest Gump popped into my head when... That was what I thought, too. <laughs> okay, thank God I'm not the only Your one. Your mom sure cares <laughs> about your schooling, ooh, son. Ooh, that's exactly what... And I'm like, I did she just... I thought the same thing. And I'm like, no, no, she didn't. No. But yeah, that was the scene that popped in my... I'm like, oh, just the way he delivered it. And I'm like, ooh. Okay, yeah, I'm glad I great. wasn't alone. Ugh. The one thing I wanted to say, and I mentioned this during our watch, the actors who played Kim's mother must have really studied the way that Seahorn speaks because the intonation was so similar that it was believable that they were related. And I think for a lot of shows that can really be like skipped over, people don't really pay attention to the like minutia Mm -hmm. of it. Listening to her talk and hearing her say certain words and being like, that sounds like him. If you close your eyes and listen to her, it sounds like you're listening to Mm -hmm. Ray Seahorn. So bravo. Yeah, Bravo, whatever good. your name is. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry I don't know it. <laughs> Colors mean a lot in this universe. Color palettes. And if you notice, Kim had a blue ponytail holder. Beth Hoyt plays Kim's mom. She did you fantastic. Killed it, Beth. You killed it. <laughs> she doesn't quite have the ponytail yet, but she's still wearing a blue ponytail holder. Wearing the blue. That's her signature color. And what does blue mean in this universe? In this universe, it's law the side of the law okay whereas your oranges and reds are chaos lawlessness chaos right okay. right okay blue and green tend to symbolize the structured and orderly side some of that is similar to color psychology orange is considered a cheap color so that's fitting mm. that it's like oh. just throughout with like yeah. Okay. Jimmy. yeah <laughs> one of my favorite details um <laughs> in season five when he and mike are out in the desert and they're spending the night First, yes. Mike offers him the space blanket, which he refuses. Then they cracks two light sticks. One of them is green and one of them is orange. And he gives Jimmy the orange one and he keeps the green one. And I just love that little subtle use of, of color in, in that scene. Mm-hmm. So In 407, Something Stupid, the opener, they do the split screen where Jimmy's making orange juice and Kim is getting her cast off. Everything in the room with the cast, where she's getting her cast off, is blue. And she looks really calm and relaxed and everything's cool. Meanwhile, in the split screen, Jimmy is making orange juice. He's like shoving him in there and it's it's violent. I mean, it's just those little subtle differences they put in there. And it's, it's unconscious. Even if you don't pay attention like we do, you still subconsciously notice the, the colors and, and all that. It's, it's, they're fucking brilliant. Can I just say yeah. that Jimmy drinks more orange juice than any other person like, known, known to man? <laughs> that guy is constantly <laughs> drinking orange juice. <laughs> Oranges have a negative connotation in the universe. There's always something bad going on when there's oranges around. Ooh. Well, yeah, he's got mad acid reflux, I would guess. <laughs> <laughs> Howard and his wife, we finally get to see Cheryl. Mm awkward (laughs) what they're doing now is they're really trying to make us feel bad for howard in the first couple of seasons we didn't we were very antagonistic towards howard because of the way he was treating jimmy Uh, ever since chuck's death they've really strived to make howard more um sympathetic to us Mm -hmm. and i think this is also pointed in that direction they really want us to feel 
bad for Howard. And I did because, yo, Cheryl, you were a fucking bee. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> You could have at least taken a like looked at the fucking coffee yeah, you made here before you, you just dumped it in the his, cup. You fucking his beautiful barista uh, work, unbelievable. And clean oh your God. mess up before you leave. What the hell? I know, right? Spilling her damn coffee all over. I love that Howard looked at that spot where she spilled it the same way Kim looked at the beer bottle when Jimmy left it on the <laughs> railing. Like she just looked at it like he did the same thing. <laughs> Sandrine Holt is the actress that plays Cheryl. And she was also on the first season of Fear the Walking Dead. She was Bethany Exner, the doctor that was with the California National Guard. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Mm. So, Fear fan, I didn't even Sandrine, recognize her. I, I didn't, didn't either. either. So, obviously, they're not in a good place. He's living in the guest room. And as you can tell, she will barely speak to him. The thing is, though, we don't know what made this happen we're supposed to hate her in the scene like they made it, Was really, it the hookers? really clear that we're not supposed to like her <laughs> that, like, ruin his marriage? <laughs> that's all i kept thinking of when he was like going through like if you you may see some things but just know i'm taking care of it in my head right, i was like right. shit dude did she see the hookers and she left you over this <laughs> well at least kicked you out to the guest house they don't give us a lot to go on, but it could be anything. Maybe after Chuck died and he went down into that dark place, maybe he was such an asshole she couldn't deal with it. Maybe they had problems before and that just made it worse. They don't give us anything to go well, on. Well, and we were saying, you know, it took us six years before we even knew he had a wife. I mean, she could have just been pissed off that he's working so much and like, I don't even have a husband, right. so why are we married? Obviously, she knows enough to know that he's had some problems with Jimmy. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's hard to miss someone throwing bowling balls through your car. <laughs> I also want to say that house. Oh, my God. Ugh. <laughs> Give, please. <laughs> yeah. That kitchen. Oh, okay, but like if you kitchen. had a house that Ugh. big, would we all be able to live in it together? Because that's like yes. a massive house. <laughs> we would have to. That'd be yes. the only way we could all afford yeah. it. <laughs> I mean, there'd have to be like a hundred of us, I'm sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it looked big enough to fit a hundred of us, so. Do you think that Cheryl's going to come into play later, or they just stuck her in there to explain, gives Howard a little more sympathy, or do you think that she's going to come into play later? Doesn't something mean everything in this, like, universe? <laughs> Isn't it like every little thing comes back some way? I feel like she's coming back. Maybe she hosts yeah. his intervention. <laughs> <laughs> I could see both things happening. I could see them using her as a tool to, like you said, make us feel sympathy towards Howard and having her in this scene would do just that. So could she have served her purpose by making us feel a certain way towards Howard? Sure. But I also like what Bridget just said, though. I also feel like all this shit raining down on Howard right now, it would be more impactful to see his his wife involved in that as a viewer to see her reaction to all this and maybe... Maybe she blows up and she's like, we need a divorce now. Like, I'm not waiting. There's definitely no hope for us. Because it seemed like he made a little peace sign on her coffee. So, like, to me, that means mm -hmm. Howard still has hope for reconciliation. She seemed checked out. But Howard seemed like he was really trying to work on something still. He was trying. Well, yeah, because yeah, right. he, he offered to attend that event with her. And mm -hmm. she just straight up was like, I'll go. <laughs> I was like, whoa. <laughs> You want okay. nothing to do with this dude. Yeah. Yeah. Here's another question. How much is he really going to be able to take before he snaps or breaks in some sense? Say his wife hears about the hookers and the cocaine and she doesn't believe him. What if she's like, finally, this is it. What kind of path do you foresee for Howard? I'm worried about him because they initially made this plan seem like it was going to be low grade enough that like he would still be okay at the end of it. But with everything else that's going on in his life, his life is tumultuous now. I would imagine he's still dealing with some of the guilt from what happened with Chuck. Because that's probably not ever going to go away. That's someone's mm -hmm. life that you feel is on your hands. I don't think so, but that's how he felt about it. And then he's got all this stuff going on with his wife. And Jimmy and Kim are going to come in and do something crazy involving a judge who is taking bribes. And Howard has a drug problem and a prostitute addiction apparently <laughs> because there's just constantly <laughs> prostitutes um, if it was just the plan and none of that other stuff was going on in his life 
maybe it would be like okay it's not really okay because you're like messing up a guy's life for your own satisfaction but all of this piled on top of him is like you can only handle so much i'm kind of worried about him also he's never really been in any kind of connection to the cartel but but now he does through jimmy and kim even though it's kind of a distant one it's still there yeah Ooh. what if the wrong people see him lurking around right yeah exactly Mm mm-hmm if Lalo visits while he's in the midst of something with Jimmy, Howard and the private investigator. Bridget, you just mentioned that the plan that they've got. What I'm thinking the plan is, whatever that stuff is the vet put on Jimmy to make his eyes dilate, they're going to give that to Howard somehow. And he's going to basically do what Chuck did in Chicanery when Jimmy broke Chuck on the stand and lose his mind and start screaming crazy shit about what Jimmy's doing. And nobody's going to have any clue what he's talking about. And they're all going to think he's nuts and hyped up on drugs. Mm -hmm. So the question is, do you think Jimmy somehow maneuvered this particular private investigator? Or do you think the PI is just like, they'll just somehow slip him photos or something like that? I haven't been able to stop thinking about this since you and I briefly touched on it the other night because I keep going in circles and circles and circles and circles. This is Howard's PI. He's following Jimmy. But Mike's guys are also following Jimmy. And so we said if Kim accidentally even sees Howard's guy, she's going to think it's one of Mike's guys. So if that is a true statement, who are they planning on giving these pictures to? Now we know they have surveillance pictures that look just like the photos that the PI has. So then I'm like, okay, well, that tells me they've got to know unless they have like an entirely different PI that we haven't seen yet. But my brain obviously is going to make that connection because we've already seen this one. And so then I'm like, okay, but how, how do they know that? And then Sharon, do you, what you had said, cause I'm, I was trying to piece all of this together after the boxing match, Jimmy and Kim got to him after the boxing match, but you had thrown out, An even better theory, what if Jimmy put this P.I. in Howard's path? And so this P.I. was in Jimmy's pocket before Howard even approached him. I think that is far more plausible and more likely. That is such an intense detail of a plan, like to a plan. I'm going to be impressed no matter what, right? Because it's been like fucking a hundred post-it notes. So it's like there's so (laughs) many steps to this plan. So uh, I know I'm going to be impressed, but that would be just genius. The reason I think that maybe he is, is because when he shows Howard the picture of Jimmy in the bank, he's like, well, I'm not a lawyer, but that seems pretty illegal to me. (laughs) Kind of feeding it to him. But the other option is that they send Howard the pictures under the PI's name. Because that's who they want the pictures to go to, obviously, is Howard. So they could just easily mail them. It makes the photo shoot make more sense. Because you remember how I was like, I don't understand, like, why would it be Jimmy giving him money? Like, what does that have to do with anything? But that makes sense. If the PR is following Jimmy and the photo is of Jimmy bribing the judge, Mm -hmm. that clinches it Mm -hmm. for them. So that makes sense. That does make sense. But I, I also feel like this uh, this only works if Jimmy and Kim hired this P.I. If they don't really have any affiliation with him, then I'm like, what the hell? What is going on? Well, unless I said, like I said, they mail the pictures to Howard under the P.I.'s name or have them delivered to HHM with the P.I.'s name on the package or something. They go like, oh, I just dropped these off for Howard and it's the pictures of Jimmy bribing the judge. That also means that they have to know Howard hired this guy. They have to be aware that the P.I. is following Jimmy in order for this to work out. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they they know. But and that's also why I think maybe somehow Jimmy maneuvered the P.I. into Howard's path. Mm -hmm. The next scene is with the vet. And he opens the door and lets the folks in with their little (laughs) Frederick. A little cute little puppy. And then, of course, Jimmy is there testing out the eye. It took me like three times watching to figure out what the hell I was looking at. (laughs) But, oh my God. And then I was like, oh, his fucking eyes oh, yeah. were yeah. His eyes were um, super dark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, we have our black book. Rachel, you said you were trying to figure. I was. Break some of the code. I was. I was trying to. I wrote one of the full codes down. So the only thing I was able to break down was like a semi pattern. I couldn't make sense of a lot of it. But what it looks like to me is someone's name, their phone number, and then probably what they do like Mm -hmm. nacho phone number dealer something like that but i'm think i'm right about the phone numbers because i 
searched up Albuquerque's area code, and it's 505, and a lot of these phone numbers start with the same three symbols, and it's a square Mm -hmm. with a dot, circle with a squiggly, square with a dot, 505. And then I just started like running through all the possibilities, and then I got really crazy, and I searched (laughs) Albuquerque residential phone numbers, because I wanted to see what the next three numbers would be, area code, and then three numbers, and then obviously the last four are a combination. I don't know what that part of the phone number is called. Prefix. Thank you. Prefix. The prefix. So in Albuquerque, there's 242-768-873-247-234-245 and 253. So it could be a bunch of different things. I can tell you that they are phone numbers, and (laughs) and I think I know what the symbols for one, two, four, five, and zero are for sure. Other than that... I'm not entirely sure. And then obviously there's letter codes too. And I was looking for like repeated things. There's probably names in here of people that we've never even met. Random people's phone numbers. So I'll probably spend a little bit more time on it, but not too much more time. (laughs) In the Insider, they talked about the code. And that is something that people staff on the show created. You can't Google it. (laughs) Right. I tried. It's not 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 wings, unfortunately. (laughs) It's not. (laughs) <laughs> the one card and number that we did see was the vacuum cleaner. Oh, yes. Guy. Yes. And I cannot tell you how much my stomach dropped when Kim touched that card and said, best value vacuum cleaner. I was like, no, no, no. Oh. Shut up, Kim. Don't say those words. <laughs> yeah, that was hard to watch because then uh, we immediately flashed to Gene on the phone going, I think I got made. Oh. Mm-hmm. Kim goes up to the pet board. And Jimmy's talking about, oh, why would you get out of this business? It's passive money. And she's like, he wants what he wants. I think that just was her stealing up her resolve because that's she wants what she wants. Mm-hmm. And it's to do the pro bono work and have her cake and eat it too. Mm-hmm. And I think it's very similar. He's a vet and he wants to do right by the animals. She's a lawyer. She wants to do right by these people. So that's even more so why I think she has good intentions for why she wants to do the pro bono. Like she is doing bad things for what I believe is a is a very good reason. That's the problem we have a lot oh. in this universe is people doing and in the in the Walking Dead universe, people doing yeah. the bad things for the right reasons. Mm-hmm. And I guess we have to figure out which we'll accept and which we won't. <laughs> Where do we draw that line? We all have our own personal line in the sand. <laughs> Kim in front of the judge. Oh, this was so good. Yeah, defending the guy. And you notice what she holds up is the Albuquerque Isotopes window dangler, mm-hmm. which is also what Jeff has in his taxi in uh, the gene opener. <gasps> oh, I did yeah, not that's how, notice that's how that. Saul, wow. That's how Saul figures it out. Season four opener. Mm. After he leaves the hospital and he gets in the cab and he gets all nervous and gets out of the cab, it's because the guy has the isotopes huh. after she argues the case she and cliff get coffee and um he tells her about the charity thing that, that he's interested in her being in and he asks her if she left things on good terms with howard and she says if it wasn't for her hhm i wouldn't be a lawyer and i wouldn't have my husband once again she puts lawyer ahead of jimmy mm-hmm. she also never answered the question <laughs> <laughs> She's great right, at deflecting. Right. That's a lawyer thing. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to give you an answer but not answer your question. I was hoping that she would just be like, "I got what I wanted here. You know, let's just drop the sandpiper." Thing. It's just sitting right there. All they got to do is collect it. <laughs> All they got to do is ruin Howard. Yep. No problem. Kim was a badass in that scene arguing that case yeah, like, great. "You go, girl." It's great. She's good at what she wants to do. It's not like she would be wasting anything. I mean, she really is <laughs> fucking awesome. I love when she's like, I did an informal survey of the cars in the parking lot. And judge, your car had one of these things, too. <laughs> and like uh-huh. you see the judge, and she's like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I love that moment. That takes balls, too. <laughs> this is the person mm-hmm. making the decisions, and you're going to like yeah. call her out like that. Okay. Get her, Kim. Kim's made of sterner stuff. Oh, yeah, she is. Francesca's in the office. Yes. And Kim comes to the door. And, and of course, you know, we forget they haven't seen each other for... It's been a little over a year since they closed the senior practice. Her office looks a lot different from the office that we see in Breaking Bad. She's got this classy... (laughs) It was beautiful. 
It was. It was beautiful. It was not quite as, as nice as what Sword McGill office was, but it's still pretty. It's nice. And she's got it classy, like Kim says. So when Kim comes in and she's Francesca's telling her all the stuff about how Saul let her you know, have a hand in decorating and everything. Did you feel like Kim was like, bitch, that is my money you are spending. I could be using that on pro bono cases. And why are you have so much molding in here? And why do we need water accents? That is my she money. She seemed pissed. Like, I was like, is she mad at Jimmy <laughs> for bringing Francesca back? I, like, couldn't figure out, like, why she was seemed so pissed. Maybe it was about the money. Like, <laughs> like, bitch, reel it in. This is in a strip mall. <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah where do you think you are yeah. right now <laughs> i definitely saw that too yeah she's like oh oh my office looks nice doesn't it mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> meanwhile i'm working out of a restaurant <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> oh my gosh we're seeing early francesca because of course later on and i mean in breaking bad she is totally different like she is jaded and a hard ass and it's funny to see her now. Again, she's just like Jimmy. She started off kind of likable, but then she just becomes a horrible person in Breaking Bad. <laughs> when they're trying to pick the mustache to go on their ca- Casimiro. So the actor that plays the actor is John Ennis. <laughs> and he he is an actor from Mr. Show with Bob and Dave. Oh, okay. I thought he looked familiar. His daughter is Jesse Ennis, who plays Aaron Brill on the show. Oh, oh. aww. That's so cute. I love it when they keep it all in the family. I love his line when the makeup girl is like, you're doing so good. He's like, I am, aren't I? (laughs) I'm sitting like a good boy. (laughs) That was ad-libbed. The actor ad-libbed that line and they decided to keep it because it was so funny. It was perfect. They picked the mustache. The next scene is Kimmy and and uh, Kimmy and Jim. Kimmy, Kimmy and Jimmy. And Jimmy. <laughs> I do. I, Kimmy and Jimmy. I did that too. I do it all the time. He, and she's telling him about the opportunity and everything. And this was also a mirror in 208 Fifi when she gets Mesa Verde. And it's like she's almost afraid to be happy that she got it. I think she feels the same way this. Mm-hmm. She almost is afraid to let herself be happy that she achieves this. I'm, I wonder if it's because she achieved it without having to do anything underhanded to get it. Maybe like it undermines the justification that she's built in her head. If I can get what I want by doing things the right way, then why did I ever do anything the wrong way? Mm. But I mean, have you noticed in every episode, somebody is trying to talk her out of what she's doing without trying to talk her out of what she's doing? For instance, when Viola's like, I really love that you're doing this. You made made me change the way I think about the law. And then in this episode, it's Cliff. Cliff. And even when Jimmy gives her the out at the end of the episode, he's like, we don't have to do this right now. We can regroup. What is it in her that just makes her determined to keep on with it? And I think it ties back to her mother. I didn't think you had it in you. She spent her life trying to prove that she does have it in her. Whether it's what her mother wants or not, she does have it in her. And I think that's why at the end she doesn't let it go. We have, we're going to do this because I do have it in me to do this. Mm-hmm. I'm going to prove that I do. Do you think at this point it's more about sticking it to Howard than it is about the Sandpiper money? Because if it's about the Sandpiper money, even if everything had gone the way it's supposed to that day, like it's still going to take time for all that to go through. So realistically, they could have put it off a week and it's not going to make a big difference in the grand scheme of things as far as when they get that money, because there's still going to be a bunch of proceedings after that. It's going to be a long road before they get their money, no matter which way they go about it. But she was like determined. She's like, no, this happens today. To me, in that moment, it felt like it was more about getting Howard than it was about getting the money. Howard is just a vessel. Yeah, you know, it's a little bit of revenge for her, but I don't feel like that's what she's out for. I think it's more that she's just like, we've planned this and we're going to do it and I'm going to make it happen because I do have it. Even to sacrifice what she was looking so forward to, you know what I mean? Like she definitely blew that opportunity up by not going. That's why it's so confusing to, to me. If it was just about the sandpiper money, she could have pushed it off. I feel like there's almost something else driving her at that at that moment. And then it's not the car. Something lights up in her because Jim, like you said, Jimmy gives her an out and he's like, we can wait. And they can. Mm. They really can. But she's like, no, no, it has to be today. So I wonder what it is. Maybe it's like self-sabotage, though. Let's say there's some sort of deep psychological issue here, right? That stems from from the way that she grew up and from her mother not giving her what she needed. 
So maybe she's blowing it up thinking like, well, if I do the right thing, it's part of that justification. I do the right thing and I can still get what I want that way. It means that all of this time that I've spent trying to do the wrong thing and all of this setup work that we've done, I didn't even have to do it. And I've already compromised all of my values and all of my morals to do that. Married mm -hmm. the guy that I was going to do that with, it essentially makes her whole life like a sham if she goes through with this and can get where she wants to go mm -hmm. just by showing up and proving to these people that she's qualified. Do you think she's afraid of success? I, I remember feeling this very specifically as a teenager and, you know, I did mental illness also. I remember feeling guilty if I felt happy that there was something like innately wrong with being happy because I was so sad for so much of my life. Mm -hmm. And I've been able to work through that now, but that made me do stupid things that in my head, I would be like, why are you doing this? You're acting so crazy. Don't do this. You're going to ruin a good thing. And then I would still ruin the good thing because it was mm -hmm. like, it was like a compulsion. I couldn't even help myself because I felt mm -hmm. so bad about being happy. So I almost wonder if it's like, mm. if I do things the right way and that's all good and I can just be a good person. I can't have that because I've been shown my whole adolescent life and before in all my formative years that doing bad is what gets you rewarded. And now I'm mm -hmm. married to someone. Mm -hmm. Who gets rewarded for doing bad so that how can i just go do that a lot good? of sense that makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. especially when we see the hesitation when she's telling jimmy about the opportunity and we all notice her hesitation to be happy for herself i think we all even commented on it like let yourself be happy kim and there's a pattern to that because again in in fifi when she got mesa verde mm -hmm. jimmy was the one that was happy for her just like th this time, yeah. They reminded us about her childhood at the beginning of the episode, too. So it's like, hey, guys, don't remember how Kim grew up. That plays a big part into who she is today. And so that does make a lot of sense. Because I was trying to figure out, when has Kim been happy for herself? When has she allowed herself to be excited about a good thing that happened for her? Sharon? And <laughs> I can't really think of a point. And even if I look back yeah. at the time in which she had Mesa Verde, which was such a big deal to her to show, like, to give... HHM they're like comeuppance by like taking them away even mm. during that period what does she do but she self-sabotages herself takes on too much can't really put her own foot down and then ends up just like completely bombing the whole thing I'm burning myself out because I don't deserve this makes a lot of sense sorry I'm totally wrong here showrunners maybe they're like <laughs> they like hear this and they're like Psh, no that's not what this is at no all. totally wrong Tell us how wrong we are just means you're listening. <laughs> right? Tell me, like, Bridget's a dumbass. And I'll be like, yeah! Yeah! <laughs> yeah. Cool. That was also a little bit of a mirror there when she turned around at the end, 407, when she was trying to get Huel off. And she had the idea for the Kushada scam. She stopped and turned to Yui in the middle of the road and went to the supply <laughs> store and started buying art products. Casper, oh. chopping wood. The actor actually came a few days early and learned how to actually chop wood for that scene. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's so funny to me. Oh, Hollywood. Learn how to chop wood. Oh, sweet baby. <laughs> Pretty funny. Oh, that's so precious. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I learned how to do that when I was like four. <laughs> oh <laughs> like, my gosh. It's like, this is crazy. I mean, I don't think I was four, but I was definitely in single digits. <laughs> Very good. But here comes, here is the axe from Axe and Grind. The grind, I think, is supposed to be all the coffee that's apparent in this episode. <laughs> Even when Cliff and Kim are in the courthouse, the scene that cuts between the courtroom scene and their scene is the coffee cup coming down and like coffee oh, just yeah. <laughs> splurting all over the place. And then, of course, we have Howard's coffee at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Mike bringing his boy coffee. So Casper's out in the woods. As soon as I saw the car come flying up, I was like, oh, that's Lalo because yep. he's the one to be driving like crazy up the dirt roads. Yep. And of course, Lalo pulls a gun on him and casper runs casper had the right idea he just should have used the other end of the axe is all i'm saying but yeah again he doesn't know who this guy is he doesn't know it's lalo he doesn't want to murder somebody in his house 
I was so mad that Lalo immediately pulled a gun. I shouldn't be surprised, but I was still mad because he could have very easily diffused the situation by just being like, oh, wait, 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 man, I'm just here to talk. He really was there just to talk and get information. Like, he didn't have to assault the guy. I don't know, maybe he was itching to hurt somebody because it's been a minute. I'm not sure. I don't know. But that he, irritated me. He, he, can't, he can't right? spare everyone <laughs> this season, yeah. okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So that Lalo irritated me when he pulled a gun immediately instead of talking through his feelings. And then when Lalo's showing Casper the business card, Casper leans forward to look at it instead of taking it from him. What? No, Mm -hmm. you grab that shit and you look at it. (laughs) Well, he showed up early also to learn how to look at that business card. (laughs) How to properly read font. (laughs) Or... You say, set the card down on the ground and I will pick it yeah. up and look at it. Yeah. That was pretty gnarly foot chop. <sighs> you can see his fucking booted foot lay there next to his legs. Oh. All... It was gnarly. Lalo must be like freakishly strong too, to do that in one half a swipe. He didn't even wind up. He was just like, kick foot off. Maybe it's mm-hmm. in the Walking Dead universe and bones are like jello. <laughs> They're brittle. Yeah. They're- <laughs> Everyone's got brittle <laughs> bone disease. Bone. <laughs> Stop right through it. <laughs> and I'd like to say it was a sharp axe, but it looked pretty jagged, didn't it? That stump. <laughs> I know it was kind of quick. It was still effective. So yeah. um, I'm pretty sure Casper is going to be dead. If he doesn't tie it off. <laughs> well, it, well, I mean, Lalo can't risk anything going back to the States. But hey, this guy came out here and cut my fucking foot yeah. off and asked me a bunch of questions about Frank. Which brings up something else. Exactly how much information is Casper going to have? Because they never saw the outside of the building. I don't even know if they knew they were in fucking Albuquerque, to be honest. Probably not. Because when they're in the truck, Werner says, from the sounds of it, it sounds like there's a town close by. I don't even think they know they're in Albuquerque. Mm -hmm. They know the specs, but I don't think they know specifically what they're building. They don't know it's going to be a drug lab. They just know that they're here to build this underground thing. Mm -hmm. They don't know where it is. They possibly know about Fring. I'm sure they've heard the name Gus Fring between Mike and and Werner at some point. So they might know that. But the whole point is, what? How much information can he possibly give to Lalo? Well, like you said, he knows the specs of what they were building. So even if he tells Lalo that information, Lalo might be able to take it and figure it out from that. Or he's gonna rat on the other guys he worked with, and Lalo's gonna make his way through everybody. But none They'll of them all have the same information. Know. I feel like though, they right? Have the same information. Doesn't, doesn't Kai have like a little bit more than everybody else though, or does he not? There was one point where they all went out. To a bar because the guys needed some R and R. And that is the only way they would possibly know where they were. Mm-hmm. Because when they moved the guys in and out, they backed the laundry truck up to the door and the guys got in the laundry truck. And then when they got to their destination, whether it was the laundry or the house, they backed the truck up and they went back out the door. So they never saw where they were. And they never saw that they were at the at the laundromat or anything like that. So I just don't know how much information mm-hmm. be able Ziegler to Ziegler would have had it all, but he's gone, so unless Werner Told them where we you know what they were doing and where they were and stuff. Mm-hmm. Which we he could have. He had a hard time keeping secrets. So that's this is true. Yes, he did. This is true. What do you think Lalo will do once he gets the information he wants? He's dead. He's he's dead. Oh yeah. After that. I'm also thinking longer term here though because Lalo wants proof that he can take back to Hector. He needs something to take. Well, to the cartel. Yeah, but I think to, he to a lot of on both sides. Well, I think he wants specifically Hector to know so that Hector will basically be like, okay, yeah, go ahead and kill the chicken man now. Because Hector was the one that demanded proof. They need the proof to show the cartel so they have reason to take Gus out. Because they need to show Eladio and Bolsa that Gus is is trying to work outside of their cartel. Yeah. And then they can take Gus out. Because he still brings in the money. So they, you yeah. know, they're going to be on his side until, until they can't be because he's been proven to be super sketchy. Yeah, I guess I got the impression. Oh, well, we heard Don Hector say, fuck Eladio, fuck Bolsa, fuck these guys. It would be a better plan to take this to Eladio and Bolsa and say, look what he's doing. And okay. And then they're like, yeah, go ahead and take him out. Mm -hmm. That would be the smart play. But Hector's more of a action first, think later. Yeah, they're kind of hot heads. So I feel like, I feel like even if just Hector had enough satisfactory proof for himself, he'd be like, okay. Go ahead, Lalo, kill him. And then he'd get himself in a shitstorm of trouble, too. But I'm thinking about this proof. Is just information enough? Or will he need something tangible to take back and say, how 
strong does the proof need to be, I guess? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I guess if they can somehow point them to the underground thing, maybe that would work. But since if they can't prove what they're trying to build, then... Right. And it's not even built. I, I don't know. I just, so, yeah. So is it really a right, threat as right. of right it's now? It's just yeah. an underground. Yeah. It's just an <laughs> underground thing right now. So. Right. I trust the writers. Though. Oh, absolutely. These writers, I trust. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have any guts this episode. A lot of that was probably due to the fact that Sean Carlos Esposito was directing. Do we care how Lalo got to Germany? I'm sure he's got fucking fake documents and he f flew out of Mexico as somebody else's name. And we see he has money everywhere. He has money stashed everywhere, probably. So Fair I, enough. I didn't even Fair really enough. think about that. And, and I don't really know how. Well, if everyone thinks he's dead, they're not looking for him anymore either. So I guess there's that. Right. He used the name of the farmer he killed. Mm -hmm. Just his take, body double. take his life over. Yeah. They looked enough alike. Francesca in her beautiful... <laughs> waiting room with all the dirty disgusting people in it <laughs> poor Frances. this is what just breaks her and you know it she's already irritated about this makes her do this phone call that she obviously doesn't want to do it, they come back in and dude's using the water attraction in a way it's not meant to be used oh my God. and saul's like hey oh clean God. up on oh online God. she's like clean it up so yourself i was like you pee. go that's yeah. right francesca you make him clean up tell clean him it up. Jimmy is already very easily falling into Saul. He was never that rude or mean to Francesca ever when they were at Wexler McGill, making mm -hmm. her do things like that. He's going down and he's just going to fucking take whoever is around him with him, whether they want to go or not. I love how she's like, is this illegal? And he's like, no, no, I'm a lawyer. Are you a lawyer? <laughs> like, Again. That wasn't wasn't an answer. answering, but not answering. Yeah, right. Yep. Lawyer right. 101. Never answer a question. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to have a constitutional discussion with you every time I need you to do something for this me. This isn't this isn't going to be a, an all the time thing, right? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I love how Jimmy, before he and Francesca go out into the alley to make to, to make this call, we see him open the drawer of burner phones and he grabs the phone. And then he immediately puts it in his pocket so that when it's time for Francesca to make this call, she sees him pull it out of his pocket. So she's probably assuming this is his personal cell phone, not a burner. I felt right. like that was an extra layer of deception. I think it would have made her feel better if she thought it was a burner phone instead of his personal. If she thought it was his phone, he's sort of accountable, too, because, you know, it's from his phone. So then again, would HHM even answer a phone call from Jimmy McGill? <laughs> right. <laughs> the angle when they're getting the pin number and Jimmy's writing it on his hand and they're the filming the angle looking down. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. I just loved how they filmed that shot. We're looking down on them because they're just the most terrible people. <laughs> looking down on Jimmy in particular. I was getting nervous because I didn't think he was writing the numbers fast enough. <laughs> The numbers are 842159, just in case you want to know. That may be important later, but probably not. Did you add them all together and divide them by four? And No, I'm just <laughs> It's 42. <laughs> Mike, he's meeting with Aww. Ghost Laundry. I love how they cut from Jimmy being like, clean up on aisle nine to the laundry. <laughs> right? Clean up. Clean up, and then, and then we're at the laundry. Funny. He's, he's picking the laundry up out of the floor. Which I found disgusting, by the way. No, yeah. take that out of there and rewash it, please. <laughs> hopefully it was on its way to the washer. Hopefully, hopefully. So the next scene is is Mike and Tyrus is asking him about why he's taking protection off of himself and who's getting protection. The first thing I thought when he said the house, the place on Alameda was that it was Nacho's dad. I did too. But when you go back and rewatch it, he mentions the Varga upholstery shop in the list. So I obviously it wasn't. Well, but that's it the turns shop. Out it's, um, I thought Alameda was still his dad's right, house. Right, Yeah. Right. It turns out it's Kaylee and Stacy. So I was thinking about this scene and how much Mike obviously loves Kaylee Ugh. and how sad it is that he just disappears. They never know what happens to him. He just disappears and leaves her at the park one day and then they never see him again. That is why it's important to watch Breaking Bad before you watch Better Call Saul because while you don't have to know what happens to these people, it gives you that extra layer of depth and understanding when you know what happens to them eventually. This is one of those scenes that, while it wasn't really necessary to the show, 
to move the plot along or anything like that. It's just one of those things that makes you stop and think about the characters and they're fucking people. It was very touching. In my reading uh, of stuff, the articles written about this episode in particular, they did mention that because of Gus and Mike's own paranoia, that's why Mike has to do this where he's looking from afar. And it's so sad to think that he has lost so much time with his family because of this. And it's even more sad when you know what happens to him later, which I actually don't even really like to think about because he was always one of my favorites on Breaking Bad. So I really Me struggle too. with that. Fucking Walt. So it's like horrible to know what his fate is in the end and to know that he's missing out on so much because of what he's gotten himself into. I just really hate it. I was near tears during that scene. It was really, it was just so sad to see him be so close and -hmm. not be able to reveal himself. It's heartbreaking. I don't know why, but at first I kind of thought that they knew Mike was like watching them. Yeah, I did too. But then she mentioned Chattanooga and I'm like, oh, okay, never mind. They think he's out of town. Because I'm like, that's why she's coming out in the front yard, right? So that he can see them and, uh, but Mm -hmm. no. I know that was my hope that they'd come up with this like plan, you know, so he could still see them. And it's just so sad. I guess it's not really a connection, but I was just thinking about them stargazing and the fact that he was reading her The Little Prince last season. Oh, because that's about about space, right? The kid landing. Yeah. Yeah. That's a tie in to Fear Fear the Walking Dead, too. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. Yep. They're in the same universe, I'm telling you. Kim and Jimmy in the apartment. They're doing their nighttime things. Jimmy's washing the dishes. Kim's doing whatever the hell she's doing. After they finish their little chores, they go and look at the layout again. And Kim opens up the pen like she's going to write something else. You know, we need to note something else. Jimmy's like, nah, I think we've got it. It's except for the broken arm, which we find out later. They do not have it. We didn't miss anything. Uh, Yeah, you did. Right. We didn't miss anything. (laughs) And I like that they go to sit at HHM because really HHM is where it all began for them. That's where they met. And that's where they both became lawyers. That's where they started their relationship. Everything that they are is wrapped up in HHM. Even though they're not a part of HHM anymore, that's where they came from. And I love that they went back and sat outside of the offices. And I bet you that was Jizz Waldo vacuuming the floors in the <laughs> conference room. I just, I just thought that was really sweet. And the way Jimmy looked at her... He just loves her so much. I love it. I love them so much just because of that. And again, she looked away and looked at the office. <laughs> She's like, yeah, I love you too, but. Oh. <laughs> I just love the law so much. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Omaha, Omaha Beach, Omaha, mm-hmm. Nebraska. So there's a little, a little tie in there. Mm-hmm. Jimmy at the liquor store getting some Zafiro and Neho. I love that the guy is like, I was going to warn you about the stopper. It's really sharp. It's like, hmm, what are they trying to say here? <laughs> so where's the stopper from the first bottle? We saw Kim take it from her desk at Schweikert in Maine when she left, but where's it at now? Have we seen it since then? I think she's still got it. Okay. I mean, as far as I know, she still has okay. it. Of course, we saw that Jimmy had it in the... Right. Well, Saul. Saul had mm-hmm. it in the opener. And he didn't end up buying that bottle, so that makes me believe that that stopper we right, saw is right. the original one. Right, because he set he set the bottle down mm-hmm. and left. He sees Casimiro, who has the broken arm. We had a dude with a broken foot in the office, and now we have Casimiro with a broken arm. <laughs> so he calls Kim, and as we talked about earlier, he tries to give her an out that she does not take. I am really worried for Kim. I don't know what she's what she's going to do. The preview for the next one, and like it looks like she's out in a field in a like a courtyard or something with with mm-hmm. the film student kids and she's yelling action so when you guys saw casimiro in the liquor store what did you think i was like oh, what shit. are the odds that this dude is here now like jimmy was right when he was like well at least this happened before because i was like you caught the biggest break in seeing him before you went forward with anything i actually was thinking they should find out when that happened because what if it had happened like mm. the day before what if that cast was just on there for a day? I was thinking maybe you should go put your eyeballs on this dude ahead of time. Yeah. Just to be sure he didn't shave his mustache. Because they were all worried about him shaving his mustache. But they didn't bother to go check and see if he'd done anything else. Jimmy comes out and he does what, of course, he should do, which is better call Kim. <laughs> and he's like, hey, Kim, let's put the kibosh on this. And she says, no, nah, we're going to do it. But the look on her face, like you could see her 
really struggling with what to do. And um, God, give this I know we already kind of already. talked about it. Oh, my God. Seriously. I know we already kind of talked about it, but I think she heard her mother whispering in her ear, I didn't think you had it in you. And that's why she decided, no, we're going we're gonna to do this. Maybe to show her mother wrong or prove her mother right. I'm not sure. How fitting that she yeah. was in the car at that exact moment then, too. Do we know yeah. the status of her relationship with her mom? I know we're not we're not clear on whether or not she's alive, but do we know if they have a good or bad relationship anymore? Other than the two flashbacks, yeah. we don't know anything. Do we know anything about her dad? Only that he loved Ice Station Zebra. Literally. She was like, this is my dad's favorite movie. And that's <laughs> like all we know about him. Yeah. Okay. I'm torn about how I feel feel about Howard. I am feeling really bad for him, but like, should I? I don't know. <laughs> the, the way they're portraying him now, he had this big breakdown over Chuck, and now he's battled his way back, and he's doing good now, and, and now Jimmy and Kim are just going to fucking destroy him again. It's sad. And here's something. I know we love Jimmy and Kim, but do we like them? <laughs> do we like what they're doing? This, to me, was a real turning point. She's done things that have kind of irked me, but this turning her back on a real opportunity to pull this mm. really bothered me. For me, it's like, I don't really care for you as a person. This is horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and you think back to what they did to Irene or what Jimmy did to Irene, but Kim knew about it. She knew what he was doing. They're not the nicest people in the world. I mean. no. Yeah, if they were real people in life, Right now, we would probably not be friends with them. <laughs> it's the same the same as Walter, because we were written. It was written yeah. for us to like Walter, yep. to be on Walter's side. Walter was the fucking bad guy. Yes. I love Jimmy and Kim, but they're the fucking bad guys. Not the worst guys. The guys. There's plenty plenty out there they're worse. Not, no, they're not but, the worst guys. But yeah, they're, they're yeah. not good guys. In, in, their, in their corner of the story, they're, they're the bad guys. They're doing shady ass shit. Mm-hmm. Well, the real and heroes. For it. it makes it exciting. Are the Kettlemans, honestly? The real <laughs> yeah, this the whole Kettlemans. thing. They're the heroes. <laughs> I think the vet is the hero. He's the one that really cares. Francesca's my hero. Oh yeah, and he's yeah. like he's like <laughs> leaving it behind because he's just, it's just not worth it. Good luck with that. How's that going to work? How many people do you know get out of the cartel? Um. Yeah, but I don't think he was yeah, in the cartel. Think he's he was he's the guy, man. though. Like, he's the guy you call when you need a guy. Well, he's going to sell his black book, and they can call that guy now. It's but this individual still has all the information of everything, all the people he's met, all the things that have gone down. I feel like he's still a liability for the cartel. I just don't see him getting out as easily as he thinks it's going to be. Well, he also said he's moving, so... Maybe he means. Hopefully, like he's he does like it real fast. Moving, moving. <laughs> yeah, but he's going to Omaha. <laughs> there you go. He's going to Omaha. There you go. We'll see him at the Cinnabon. <laughs> oh, <God. Yeah. laughs> Four oh five. Quite a ride. Where they show the flash forward of Saul closing up his office with Francesca, and he tells her to be by the phone on November thirteenth at three p.m. So November thirteenth is. Jimmy McGill's birthday. Oh. So the speculation is that it's Kim calling him from prison on his birthday. And that's why Francesca has to be there to answer the phone. Mm -hmm. Because Jimmy's going to be in hiding at that point. I am mm -hmm. feeling very, very strongly that Kim's going to end up in prison. My guts are telling me she's going to get caught. And the way she's acting right now, I think she might make a slip up not being patient. But then how does Kim get in trouble and Jimmy doesn't? Unless she takes the fall for him. But do we really see her doing that? I'm not sure. If it's something that she feels like she's done to put him there. Okay. Like it's not something that wasn't his fault, maybe. Well, maybe but she's not going to taking... take something on that he did and say well, maybe she she'd be it. taking responsibility for the fact that she pushed this even though... He was saying, let's not do this because the timing is not right. Mm -hmm. Something maybe is going to go bad. Yeah. I almost wonder if what they're doing to Howard is going to come to light. They think they've planned everything out so carefully. But what if Howard is a step or two ahead and catches them somehow and Kim gets busted for it? One of the things that one of the other podcasts brought up is when they're talking to the vet and they're asking about the drug and the vet says it depends on how much caffeine you're used to. Mm -hmm. So Howard, when we see Howard with his wife, he makes her the coffee 
but he makes himself tea mm-hmm. and it gives him a heart attack or something. And He could have a heart oh, condition yeah. that he's never spoken about. Patrick Fabian learned how to do that, by the way, learned how to do the coffee. Oh, he actually, he did, actually that? did that himself. Oh, that's so cute. Yeah. Oh, did he come in a day early? Well, they said, they said, <laughs> they, <laughs> they said they didn't, they weren't sure if the actual one that they used was one that he did. He really did Aww. learn how to do the espresso and all that to make it. That yeah. is really cute. If I were an actor, I would want to learn how to do all these extra things, right? Right. It's part yeah. of the fun. Learning all these new things. All right, everybody. Thank you for coming. Make sure you join us next week for the mid-season finale. Mm. Plan and execution. It's so scary. Come join us in the chat. You can ask us questions. We'll try to answer them. Throw your two cents in. We always want to hear your theories and what you think is going on. Tell us on. how dumb we are. Right. Tell us how wrong we are. <laughs> Tell us how much you hate Howard. Yeah. And why. Don't just say you hate him. Tell us yeah. why. <laughs> or maybe yeah. you love him. And then um, tell us why. And tell you us love why. So right. <laughs> yes. Right. <laughs> Namaste. <laughs> Namaste. Thank you for joining us. Me, Blazy Gardner, been joined by Rachel, Cosmo Mama 9, Bridget, X Prophecy Girl, and Ain't My First Radio. Yeah. I remembered them today. <laughs> <laughs> All right, peace out. Better call Kim. Bye. Bye. <laughs> call Kim. Thank you for making it to the end of another episode of Better Squawk Saul, our coverage of Better Call Saul's sixth and final season. I've been your host, David Cameo, and I was joined by Cosmom09, Rachel Burt, Sharon D, aka Blazing Gardner, and Survivor's Tier member, Bridget, X Prophecy Girl on Twitter, and Ain't My First Rodeo on Instagram. And if you made it to our sixth episode of Better Squawk Saul, covering Better Call Saul's seventh episode of the sixth and final season, titled Plan and Execution, you were also joined by Aiden Atkin, at Aiden underscore Atkin underscore on Instagram, and at Aiden the Raven on Twitter. If you like what you heard, head over to ratethispodcast.com slash squawking dead. Leave us five stars and an eggplant to let us know that you love us, but we're going to need a little bit more than that from you guys because Better Call Saul, that's a new thing for us. We want to know what you liked, what you didn't like, whether we should just stick to the Walking Dead universe, or if you want much more of this to come, use it as a means to communicate your desires after every episode. And if you leave your social media accounts, we will tag you when we post this review on social media. And if you really, really want to be involved in how these episodes shape out. You want to support the podcast? All you need to do is create a free account on ko-fi.com and follow us at ko-fi.com slash squawking dead. You don't have to buy us a coffee for 30 days of supported back content, which includes the ability to download our unedited episode recordings or stream them. You don't have to join a membership tier for as little as a dollar a month, which includes discord access, as well as a whole host of baseline perks. All you got to do is follow us. It lets you know when we record, when we drop our unedited episode recordings and when we think of a new idea that we want your feedback on it's the only place we post these things we don't post these things on social media and speaking of membership tiers we'd like to thank both our survivors and whispers tier members in that order among them include of course bridget x prophecy girl on twitter and ain't my first rodeo on instagram who joined in these episode breakdowns as well as at eliza jones 71 on instagram and at jones aj6 on twitter at real ryan gm on twitter jasmine at jasmine Dot IAC on Instagram, and of course, fanartlindy, ko-fi.com slash fanartlindy. And let's not forget our Whispers tier members, who include, of course, at Aiden underscore Atkin underscore on Instagram, and at Aiden the Raven on Twitter, at RitasFan2 on Instagram and Twitter, at j 13 Voorhees on Instagram and Twitter, at Sandy.D.Morrison on Facebook, at FrostedAngel67 on Twitter, at Tyler Philip Cox on Instagram and Twitter, and of course, at Judith.Morton on Instagram. I'd like to thank you very much for making it to the very end of this podcast and for always listening to Squawking Dead. We hope you're enjoying this and we'll see you in the next one.